I'm home. Nebraska's been our home since I was born. Left for college, came back home. Ministered here, home. That place right over there is where I was called into ministry at age 15. So this is home. And we as a committee would love to welcome you to a dialogue. Uh, we think that's an important element to learn as we lead, but it, secondly, I think it's a very powerful way to learn. So I'm going to ask the panel to come up. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask them some very specific questions. When they're done, we're going to break up into five or six groups and ask you to join one of them because we have some questions that we want to give you an opportunity to begin thinking about. We know this kind of conference is very powerful. We also know that if we attach it to something for follow-up, it increases its effect much more powerfully. So that's a part of what we're doing. We have guests that are teaching us. We're having panel, but it really is also the follow-up that makes the change. So I'm going to ask the panel to come up if they would. Thank you much. And they get to introduce themselves, and then we'll go from there. Welcome to my home. By the way, this didn't look like this when I was 11 and 15. This is really cool. Right there's the mics, guys. Thank you. Bart, we'll start with you. Name and where you're serving. There we go. My name is Bart Wilkins. I serve here in Babylon. <laughs> Exile and foreigner and stranger in this land. Uh, I'm in Omaha, Nebraska at Flatland Church. I am Jennifer Vandemitt, and I, too, am in Omaha, but not with that detailed description, at Southridge <laughs> Church. And I'm Steve Mallory. I am definitely not in Omaha. Uh, I'm in Crawford, about as far from Omaha as you can be. I'm Mariano Menendez, and I'm in Columbus, Nebraska. Thank you for sharing your lives with us and answers today. So, Steve and Jennifer, we asked a distinct question from them. So, Steve, what do you want us to know about your life and your ministry journey? That is such a loaded question. It is. Uh, but Unload for, it. But for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to share about a time in my life that was B.C., and that would be before Crawford. Um, <laughs> Because there, there was a season of my life, uh, I graduated Evangel University, uh, mathematics and biblical studies, it's a wonderful combination. Uh, math is God's love language, I like to say. Um, people don't believe me, so I just let them not believe me. You with me, Bart? Okay, good. Me and Bart aren't together a lot. We are, we're, we are incredible friends. That I'm in Omaha. Yes, he's in Omaha and I'm in Crawford. We do well together. Um, but anyway, uh, God brought me back to my home church. I got to serve uh, see my family saved, baptized my family, um, did Swiss Army pastor, youth kids, associate, janitor, whatever the lead pastor needed. Uh, got married in that season of my life and was hurt incredibly. Um, I don't like to talk about that season too much because God brought me out of that season. Um, but the reality was uh, it's one thing to be hurt by a pastor, but it's a whole other thing when it's your home church. And your family's involved. Just got married, so honeymoon was me coming home and loading on my wife. Uh, really interesting season of our life. So in that season, obviously, we knew it was time to transition. Uh, I'm a slow learner, so it took me a while to figure that out. We were there for about eight or nine years um, and started to look for positions. And what I found out was ordained and nine years of ministry experience was not enough. Uh, we started sending resumes, uh, started in Kentucky, went to Ohio, went to like Tennessee, Indiana. I had a district superintendent tell me, do you want to know what's wrong? I said, that'd be great. Uh, he said, you don't have enough experience. I said, what do you mean? I just served for nine years as a Swiss Army guy. That wasn't enough. Um, so God in his sovereignty, uh, he brought us to a place that I could have never found that every kid dreamed of in college. You know, I graduated Evangel, and I always dreamed in my classes of pastoring a church of 28 in a town of 1,000. You know what I'm saying? Um, and really, for me, that was what I felt my reward for this season in my life. I came to ministry retreat my first year in Nebraska. And do you want to know what I heard when I told people I pastored, where I pastored? That place, I'm not kidding you, uh, is the trapdoor to hell 
and it's a dry and barren land. And I'm thinking, Lord, this is where you called me. Um, sometimes our wounds, they carry through our life. And those words, my father-in-law, we'd been here for a little while. Um, I remember we were sitting in my brother-in-law's apartment in Florida, and he looked at me and he said, when are you going to spread your wings and fly? Because my assignment was never enough. Um, where I was never measured up. And it wasn't just words. It wasn't just things. It was myself as well. Because we bring our wounds with us, so BC became part of AC or whatever in Crawford, where I started to allow myself to find value that was dependent upon my circumstance. And so I'd come to meetings like this, and I never measured up. Um, I was privileged to be elected or appointed presbyter because I was the default presbyter. Um, there were no other ordained ministers in the panhandle or northwest panhandle at that time. And so I became a presbyter. I walked into a room, and I was overwhelmed because I didn't measure up. Um, my worship leader and I would have conversations, and we were obedient to the Lord. We were doing what God wanted, and we had gone from like 28 to 35. You know, and I'm sitting here, and um, I'm not sure if Pam was in here right now, but what she said, I had a moment with the Lord. You're back there. Okay. I looked here, and it was either the rapture happened and none of us were ready, um, or you weren't here. Uh, but I, I had that exact same moment where it was a worship Sunday. I'm 1,200 miles from home. Um, my wife's family's in Kentucky. My family's there. And it was a Sunday where maybe there was something going on and we might have had our 28, not our 35. And I pouted. Do you ever pout? Because our wounds, we get find identity in our wounds. And I started asking God, not worship like, where are you at? But why am I here? And is this really all you have for me? And God said to me, is this about you or me? Um, what I recognized was my value was too much in what rather than in who. Come on. And from that moment on, it doesn't matter if I have to sit next to Bart or not, and we have to tease about assessments, whether he's from Omaha or I'm from Crawford. My value is I'm obedient to Christ. That's right. My value is I'm serving where he called me to be. And if he calls me to stay in Crawford for, we've been there going on 14 years now, um, if he calls me to be in Crawford forever and pastor that community, I'm going to do the best I can because this is where he wants me to be. And all I desire to hear is well done. And I think, pastors, if I could say anything about my story, please do, is that I think too often we find our value too much in what rather than in who. Too often we're emotionally high or emotionally low based upon what happens on Sunday morning. Or how many people respond at an altar call. I promise you, I feel like I'm pretty good at preaching. And I've been the only one to respond to my altar call several times. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Because I just want to be radically obedient to what God has called me to be. And as long as he approves me, I'm not worried about the approval of others. So that's what I had to share. Who is he, not who are we, is a big difference. Yeah. Depression is real in ministry, guys. And a lot of it's because of this. This sense of inadequacy and who we are defined by what we do. I don't know about you, but when I read Exodus, I'm interested. Moses, I think, was a pretty effective leader. I don't know about you, but I do. But I know he got to the point he said, kill me. I'm done. Now, you haven't, maybe you said that, maybe you haven't, but I understand the anguish of not knowing what to do, but he does. Somehow God worked in his life something powerful. Jennifer, what would you like the group to know? Um, I just want to share a pretty, a lot of you probably know because you rode along with us during the journey, but our 16-year-old daughter, we had been in ministry only 10 years, 14 years as Christians, and our 16-year-old daughter was killed in a car accident. We had just come off of pastoring a church, um, planting a church in kind of a rougher inner city area and um, just doing life. Like Troy was serving on a district level, um, 
reach Nebraska ministering and all of a sudden we get a police officer shows up at our house with this news that you need to come with us to the, to the hospital. And I remember walking in and they set you in this little room and I remember hearing the Holy Spirit say, it's going to be okay. Well, I transpose she's going to be okay. So all the doctors came and all these things that were wrong with her weren't going to be right and we'd have to, she lost a kidney and all of this other stuff that had to happen to her physically, but she was going to be okay. Well, fast forward into the night, um, she wasn't waking up. And Troy said, like, hey, I think we need to get another scan of her head. Something's not right here. So they did another scan. And as you guys know, I mean, a lot of you walked through it with us. They called us into this little room. And uh, the neurosurgeon said, she's not going to make it. And I remember at that moment just thinking, wow, like, like we're Christians. Like, we chose to give our life to God. And we're serving in ministry. Is this a kind of payback that we get? For living a life of like, okay, we're going to not abandon chasing after money, but we're going to chase after the Lord to see him change people's lives. So there was that moment that that planted in my heart. And um, we began to walk out that grief and we couldn't have done it without the body of Christ. So it's not like we didn't try to shake heaven right for a miracle. We had people walking the hallways that they had to open up rooms for us at the hospital because people were praying intense. So we sought God desperately for a miracle. She was our oldest of five kids. So when, when tragedy happens like that, it, it doesn't just affect you, it affects everybody, right? In your whole family, your whole community. And um, a couple of things that, that the Lord deposited in me during that time is, the first one is, is I had to be confident in my calling. Like, was I called or was I not? So because our life before Christ was, was crazy, drugs, alcohol, you name it, it was crazy, I literally sat down and thought, what am I going to do? This hurts so bad. I've, I've, I've done the highs. I've done the alcohol. I've done the promiscuous. I've done all of that. And it only brought temporary satisfaction. So all right, I'm going to choose you, Lord. I'm going to choose to buckle up and hang on and see what happens. So that was the first one is I, I chose to be confident in my calling. Like God has called me. This isn't going to shake me. This isn't going to detour me off. I'm, I'm, I'm rocky right now, but I'm not going to fall off. And the second one is I had to choose to um, just to be intent, intent like be, like be real and, and look at, at what's going on inside of me. How am I going to stay healthy? What am I going to do when I, our world is rocked? And I know many, I mean, all of you in ministry have something that happens, right? Something that shakes you that's like, what the heck is this? And we have to be on the offense to choose, what are we going to do with it? What are we gonna, how are we going to respond? Am I going to be healthy or am I going to be like unhealthy dealing with it? So I, I chose to read every book on grief that I could possibly get my hands on. I chose to sign us up for every grief class that I could. I chose to uh, seek out mentors that were farther along in losing children. It's a whole world. If you haven't lost a kid, there's a world out there that's lost a kid. And, and you don't know about it until you lose your own. So I sought out mentors that were down the road. I interviewed them like I was probably weird, but I did. Like I would be like, hey, I want to interview you. And I, I had to let people go. Like I don't want to be you in 10 years. That's not where I want to be. I don't want to be you in seven years. And at that point, I didn't, I didn't care. I didn't care what people thought about me. I just knew I needed to stay healthy for me, for my kids, for my husband, for the ministry that God's called us to for a lifetime. So I guess that'd be the things that I want you to know about me is you can do the same thing. So when life gets hard, choose to get healthy. Choose to be confident in your calling. Don't be a frog caught in the hot water, right? Don't just sit there. Don't just sit there because you'll explode. You've got to do something about it. You've got to get healthy. We, we, we changed and become transparent in, in how we lived life. Like, no, we're not good. We're bad. I remember Dave argue. He was our pastor at Christ Place when it happened. And he w met me in the hallway one time a couple months after. And he said, how are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm doing terrible. And if you remember Dave, like he was not like a person given to a lot of emotions. He was like, whoa, whoa, like, okay, um, well, what do we do with this, you know? But you just become that. Like, and that's kind of come back to bite us sometimes because we're so transparent that it's awkward for people. But we don't ever pretend anymore because life's too short. 
And ministry is really, we lead people that are struggling. And if they think that we're perfect, we are doing them a great disservice because none of us are. So if you can allow them in at your weakest moments, keeping God at the forefront, you'll see the reproduction in their lives. They'll be transparent. You won't have a lot of fake and phony believers in our bodies, bodies anymore. Yeah. It was quiet in the room. I was on call that week. I was at the hospital, and it immediately happened. Stayed with them. Saw the neurosurgeon. It's late. I said, are we okay? She said, yeah, I think we'll be okay. Went home, got another call late, after, late evening. Walked in and to the room with them. Mm. We won't do well alone. Can you hear me? You're not going to do well alone. If you think that, you need to read the Gospels more carefully. In the most difficult moment, when he knew they were going to blow it, all of them, he still needed them there. If we think we're going to lead effectively alone, we're dreaming. It's an enemy's uh, Americanized version of Christianity. So when I'm in the room and I'm hearing them go one more time, give her a chance. We won't do well alone. That's why they're up there. Why do we do this? Because we need to see a different model of what it means to serve together. Come on. It's not just the teaching up front. That's the easier part. It's the living together, together, that stabilizes us. So for the group, everybody, here we go. I, I knew this was going to get hard, but I thought for them, not for me. <laughs> See, this is not how you're supposed to design these things. What's your view about how you're doing and how your colleagues are doing now as they lead? Or well, how am I doing? How are my colleagues doing? Um, it's a tough question because I, I just think life is a journey, and it's up, down, all over the place. Um, I think for me, the biggest question is how am I doing with the Lord? Because if I'm just circumstances, it's all over the place. And so I think that's my biggest question for me and for others is how solid am I in my faith and in my walk with, with the Lord? Is the Holy Spirit working in my life? And, uh, and there, it's just a journey. So I'm not sure how else to answer that question other than I don't know, all over the place, up, down, all over, especially colleagues and, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we are at a place that um, we're lonely and we're tired. And instead of admitting that we need each other, we tend to push each other away and think that we can do it ourselves. So I echo what you were saying. We need each other. We wouldn't have made it through the tragedy without people like you guys that walked alongside us. You didn't have to have answers. You didn't have answers, but you came alongside us. And I think we can do even better now for each other than what we've done in the recent years. Steve. Yeah, I guess I would go back to what I was sharing. I think that what I see is too much of us is dependent on who we are, what we serve or what happened on Sunday morning, mm -hmm. um, whether or not we've excelled or not or, failed miserably. I just think we're not very good in just finding that center, which is Jesus Christ. As you can tell, they didn't give me a mic. They have a mic. 
These will be disconnected pretty quickly. Yeah, Steve, you were just supposed to hold that for I him. know. <laughs> I think I was, I was here just for looks, but now I have the mic. It's okay. Well, I'll tell you, I am super excited that I wish this would have happened 20 years ago when I was starting ministry. Uh, so for you young people here, guys, you should be so grateful because what we need is authenticity. You know, for the longest time, and you know, they were saying that. We just heard, oh, you cannot be friends with the people that you minister. That's so stupid. But I remember sitting in those churches when they were saying that to us. You know, keep them like that. And I'm like, uh, how do the people person does that, you know? So I think we're in a good place where we're we being real. We need to be real. We need to be authentic. And uh, that's what really attracts people to Christ, when we pretend to be perfect, none of us are. There's only one. Yeah. Two, uh, so I'm good, but I, I just, uh, I'm a doer, you know, I move really fast, and I'm having fun. I mean, that life for me has to be fun, if not, it's misery, but, um, <laughs> but I'm taking a sabbatical. I've been um, discipling this young guy. He's been in ministry full-time now as a lead pastor for almost three years, and he's taking a sabbatical, and I'm like, what? You're thinking, of, and then I start realizing, you know, I'm so driven to do, and I want things to, you know, I'm, I empower people all the time, but, but ultimately, you have to come to the realization, I'm not needed, like I think I am. You know, think, if the church fails because I'm taking a two-month sabbatical, I'm doing something wrong, you know, and I'm like, uh, no. I'm going to take a If he can't, so can I, you know? And uh, so I'll be off October and November. I'm really looking forward. And, but it was a good checkpoint for me to just realize, no, it's okay. The church doesn't need me. The world doesn't need me. Uh, I need to stop and be with Jesus. If you get more info about sabbaticals, you should take one every seven years. Or if you don't know better, go every third. I mean, let's make it more interesting, right? (laughs) Hopes for you, for your colleagues. Hopes. Um, Well, I think I've always had this. I hope that me and my colleagues, you... um, just have such solid relationships with the Lord that we're not shaken. You know, I, I, I just think regularly about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And at the very end, he, he said, if you want to really survive, build your life on me. Mm-hmm. You know, build your life on the rock and you will not be shaken. And if I read through scripture, I just see that constantly. If I want to just do things my way, if I want the glory, if I want to chase all that, um, I'm going to just get wiped out big time. Um, If I build my um, self-worth on my perceived successes or failures, I'm going to be a wreck. If I build my self-worth based on what other people think about me. Uh, Every other week when a new family leaves our church, I'm a wreck, you know, because it's just in Omaha, it's it's just a vicious uh, merry-go-round. People change in churches all the time, and you just can't do that. And so so just walking with God, uh, basically to summarize, my hope is that we learn to really find rest in Jesus. And by rest, I don't mean sabbatical is great <laughs> vacations are great i don't mean that rest i mean the rest mm-hmm. yeah. the rest of god that he invites us into day in and day out even when i'm busy 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 i'm resting in god um that is what i hope for everybody and i think that's where we are at our best where god's spirit is working in us and um i think we we minister best out of that place so finding that and getting help to get there, like you were saying. I, I too, I echo what Bart said. I think we've gotten so busy in doing the work of ministry that we're not enjoying being with a father. And I think that's, that's not good. It's not going to be, uh, it's not, it's not impacting the kingdom of God like we want it to. 
right? I mean, we can do that at the YMCA. So I think we as leaders need to get back to spending legitimate time with the heart of the Father. Um, Bart and I communicate very differently, but we communicate the same things. Um, and I would say for me, it's well done. I just, the release that I felt, the weight lifted when Paul writes to the church in, in Galatia, you know, are you seeking, or am I seeking the approval of men or God? Um, the weight that's lifted when we recognize that this is about my father, which comes through intimacy, it comes through asking help, but really the weight that whatever it is, uh, Sunday morning, whether or not, you know, this is, just, can I, just one moment, Sunday morning, or two weeks ago, I had a masked tambourine in church. Uh, someone came into church with a briefcase. They don't usually come to church. You want to talk about a worship moment where I'm trying to say, is this about me or God? Uh, literally, this guy's second time in church, all of a sudden I hear a tambourine playing. When I came to Crawford, that was one thing I did was hit tambourines. Um, but um, You didn't just burn them? You, I did, and I just hit them. just hit them. Uh, but... Honestly, so for those who are clapping, God's challenge to me was, were you worried, worried about this tambourine for you or for me? And I had to let the guy t- play the tambourine and worship the Lord at the same time as a pastor because I'm not seeking the approval of men, but I'm seeking the approval of God. So there's, there's, a, there's a preach moment. I have a tambourine in my church, by the way. We have a couple, and I have one of those little ones from that, you know, they're being from... Ireland, yep, I don't remember the name. But the deal when you talked about hope, uh, I'm so hopeful. I am really am. And I mean, guys, I'm personal, but I'm just so hopeful to see all these young families with these kids here, guys. That gives me hope. I just met a little Josiah this morning, and I have a Josiah. The son's getting married. And, and this Josiah, dude, I mean, good-looking boy, and he was just so, and I thought, that's where the hope is. That we're raising, uh, you know, children uh, that, that love Jesus, that seeing authenticity, that, yeah, we mess up. And uh, my boy is now working with me. The greatest joy you can ever have. I mean, I get what John said. There is no greater joy to see your children walking in the light. And, and his firstborn, we both very different. And he told me, he said, I, I thought someday I might work with you, but I didn't know it was going to be this quickly. But that gives me hope. Two people told me, you know, because then you become their parent, you know. Oh, you're, you're Ian's dad. And I'm like, yep. And I'm so proud. I haven't texted him yet. But when people talk great about your kids, you know, that they love Jesus, that, they, that that's the hope I have. We're raising a generation. The Lord told me here, first year I came to camp right here, he said, I'm going to raise a generation of young men and women that are not going to compromise. They're going to go in. They're going to lead the way. And it says, and you're invited to lead them into it. And, I th- and we're seeing it now. So that gives me hope. Last question for you guys. Strategies and things that help you move to health? Particular things that you found to encourage and- I will start. Let's start this way. Come on. Before somebody uses it. No. Um, you know, I love what Jen was just saying. It's like we need to f- find what we need, you know, just to. I, I went through a grief experience that was really traumatic, too. I was a mama's boy, long story, too. But I was, it was so traumatic that I was leaving the ministry. I was just, I was done. And, and I, but again, I'm relational and I'm going to these meetings with these pastors and I have put a date and this is going to be, and nothing is working. I mean, grief causes you to think you're going crazy. I mean, really. And, and I, but, but you think I'm the preacher, you know, I'm, I'm the good lucky guy. And I really went through a deep depression. Finally. The preacher and the good looking guy. (laughs) That, that didn't, I said the go lucky guy. The what? Thank you, thanks for clarifying. I'm saying the expression, Ron. I need my wife right here. Heidi, where are you at? She's my interpreter. Um, happy go lucky guy. That's what I wanted to say. Happy go lucky. You're, You're a good looking guy, dude. You're a good looking guy. 
I know I'm good looking too, but I'm not bragging. Oh my goodness. Well, so with this, guys, we need each other. This group of people that were there, and you need to be honest and vulnerable. Nothing is working, and I'm just sobbing. We're having a pastor's meeting, and, it was, and I'm just sobbing. I said, guys, I don't know what's going on. And then one of the older men took me out to eat. I couldn't eat. I'm just crying. And he said, you're grieving. And then another guy said, hey, we have grief share at our, our church. Uh, why don't you come and do this? Now, this is one of the ministries we still do at our church because I know how important it is. So, is when in need, look for somebody. You know, we, and this is what I love, this authenticity. We all struggle in one way or another. Don't feel bad. That's the devil that keeps you like, don't tell anybody. No, nope. man, I'm running to, to, because we need to be good. And because I love our slogan. We are healthy ministers, so we need to walk in health, so to lead healthy churches that multiply. Well, how are we going to lead healthy churches if we're not healthy ourselves? So do whatever it takes to get healthy. I just wanted to ask you what you told me was wisdom before we started. (laughs) I was going to take the fifth. The Lord says, you know, even a fool looks wise if he gives his mouth shut. I guess I would look like a fool. I talked a lot. <laughs> uh, for me, it would be friends. Um, just that, and I mean authentic, real friends, ministry friends. Uh, for, that was what I noticed in my life. I still got a guy from college, my roommate in college. We talk once or twice a week. Uh, Leroy Wire and I, if you call him or me Monday mornings, I'm on Mountain Time. From about 8 till 9.30 or 10, we're typically talking. Um, just having friends um, that understand you, that will listen to you, that will stop and pray with you, that will tell you that you're not good looking, um, or whatever you need to hear at that time. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. Um, but, but, you know, friends that are willing to, to speak to you in your high moments and bring you down when you need to be brought down or lift you up when you need to be lifted up, um, I think that's what... For most of us, it's the simplest thing, but it's the hardest thing. It's relationship. I agree. I think that's for for all of us. It's community. I think the district has done a good job. We probably would have quit ministry had the district not come in and said, no, you're not going to quit. Nope. Nope, we're going to let you. I mean, Bellevue hired us on for a year to do nothing because they knew the value and the calling of God that was in our lives and had to remind us of that. So if we don't have community here... It's going to be really hard to keep making good choices in ministry. So find somebody. Find people that you can be transparent, that you can trust, that will give you honest advice and and not give up on you. Yeah, I think um, really watching out for the Messiah complex is a major uh, thing that helps. Um, You aren't responsible for... Uh, the results of ministry, uh, where you are in ministry, what's going on in ministry. You should assess what you're doing. You should, yeah, yeah, you should assess what you're doing and make sure you're doing the best job. But ultimately, uh, and you said this earlier, and I just want to piggyback off of that. God, when he returns, wants to say, well done, good and faithful servant, not good and successful servant. And if we're just chasing success, that you're, you're messing it up and you're, you're making yourself the Messiah. And that, that's just terrible. Um, but then also, you know, I just want to reiterate the whole friendship thing as well. And one of the most significant things in my life, actually, uh, I don't even know if I've told your husband this, but about a year after Tessa passed away, uh, Troy and I were driving back to Omaha from North Dakota. And uh, we, we passed a car wreck. And for me, it, you know, it's like, oh, bummer. And we got down the road about, I don't know, five minutes, ten minutes, and Troy just said to me, he said, hey, uh, Bart. I go, yeah. He goes, did you see that car wreck back there? And I said, yeah. He goes, now would be a good time to ask me how I'm doing. Um, It just woke me up, you know. And it woke me up, and it's changed me to recognize that we need to... We need to ask and, and just share where we're at Amen. because I love Troy. I just did, I wasn't aware. Mm-hmm. 
and for him to just go, hey, this is a great moment for me to help you help me. And dude, we had a phenomenal conversation and, and it impacted me way beyond that. Um, and uh, so sometimes it's just us saying, I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to reach out. I'm going to put myself out there like he did with me. And it just takes relationships to a level. It gives you a chance to release some of that tension that's inside of your mind and heart. And it was just a real big learning moment for me and a, and a great moment for us and our relationship. We're not going to do it well alone. If I've had any gift in my life, it's the people. I mean, you can do all the academic work. My dissertation on, is on reduction of perfectionism in Christian populations. I didn't even know I had the problem. That's how scary it is. You don't know what your stuff is sometimes until I was taking grad classes on expectation and all these kind of things and went, wa wom wa wong. That's me. Our family had that. I don't know if you did, but our church, in a sense, was very focused on holiness which is mostly about what you're not supposed to do and how it was framed, right? I didn't know that. So I think it does take time to realize the stuff, God's working his life in us, and we need people around us to do that. So thanks, guys. This is the real world. We're going to break now. We have a number of groups. We have, uh, let's see, stand-up team that's going to be leading, two for women, one for seniors, Mr. Brown is going to be kind of help us. We have three general ones. And we have three questions. I'll let you know what they are. What did you experience as you heard Jennifer and Steve? Notice I didn't ask what you thought. I asked, what did you experience? Second question, what were the key takeaways for you when you observed and heard the panel? And lastly, what resources do you utilize or need to acquire, I don't assume many of us has got it figured out. I'm assuming we get to keep figuring it out. So I used to play a lot of racquetball. This is one of the things that helped me Friday afternoons at Christ Place. Christ Place is an intense place to work, and I was there 17 years and a lot of giftedness. And I'd go in and beat that thing as much as I could. If you got it away. That's unfortunate that this is racquetball. You know, you hit me, I hit you. We try to figure out how we miss each other. We keep playing. I don't know about you, but racquetball's dead in Lincoln. I think there are 10 people playing that I know. So my friend, my friend, Otto Schultz, I saw him one day, said, well, come play pickleball. How many of you have ever played pickleball? I bless you, my children. <laughs> I heard that, and I watched, and I said, this is moving. That's it? That's it. Wow, you're, you're really moving. It, you, you don't run anywhere. You don't hit hard anywhere. This is not a sport. But this is what I realized. Well, you can say that the rest of your life, and you're still not going to be doing anything but sitting around on Friday afternoons. I'm learning, learning. Pickleball. Patience. Drives me nuts. Dink the ball. Dink the ball. Dink the ball. Hope they miss dinking the ball. Dink the ball. Then hit it as hard as you can at them. Here's my point. If we're not learning anything new, we're not growing. So, the questions are going to ask of you. I'm going to ask the team to stand up and go to corners, and we're going to ask you to immediately go find one. Those questions they'll ask you together, we'll get to answer them. Everything's confidential. Presbyters, we might need your help too. That might give us a little more time to talk individually. So, find a table, and whoever's leading, stand there and hold your hand up, all right? And then we'll be done in about half an hour.